Welcome everyone. My name is Lori Pastoriak and I am the Director of Interpretation at the Fairfield Museum. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. We're looking forward to welcoming Nina Sankovich, the author of American Rebels, How the Hancock, Adams, and Quincy Families Fanned the Flames of Revolution and we're really excited to bring you to the virtual museum tonight uh, at the Fairfield Museum, uh, the virtual part of us. Um, so I am again, the director of interpretation at the museum and we're really excited to welcome you tonight. Uh, so the Fairfield Museum is a private nonprofit museum and history center. And our mission is in a sense to use the past as a starting point to explore and understand uh, both past and current issues uh, and questions. And we really want to bridge those experiences and explore those questions uh, to cultivate a deeper sense of community identity um, and civic engagement. Um, and as a private nonprofit, we do rely on your support and your contributions. So if you enjoy tonight's program, you can certainly show your support by donating to the Fairfield Museum and History Center. You can always donate right on Facebook. You can also donate on our website, www.fairfieldhistory.org by clicking the donate button. button. And we also have a text to give program. Uh, at the end of tonight's broadcast, you'll see a screen come up and that will certainly um, point you to all of the different ways that you can contribute to the Fairfield Museum. So with that, um, I'd also uh, like to mention that tonight um, with Nina Sankovich, the author who's going to be joining us, uh, we are uh, partnering with our friends over at the Fairfield University Bookstore. So if you really uh, enjoy Nina's talk and you want to read her book, American Rebels, you, uh, she's going to tell you a little bit about what you can find over at the Fairfield University Bookstore. Um, stop on by there and then come on over to the Fairfield Museum and History Center because we are, of course, open to the public daily, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. under the current guidelines. Uh, and we, uh, of course, just opened our new Images 2020 photography exhibition, both the jury show indoors and celebrating Victoria Will, celebrity portraitist. Her, uh, her work is actually outdoors for the first time ever on the Museum Commons. And so with that, I would love to welcome author Nina Sankovich, who is a local Connecticut author and tonight's guest of honor. Welcome, Hello, Nina. Lori. Hello, thank you for having me. Uh, and thank you to the Fairfield Museum and History Center for inviting me to do my presentation virtually. Originally, I was going to be in person talking uh, to, your, to your members and your guests. Um, but virtually seems to be the way to go now. And I'm really happy I'm able to, to, to talk about my book, share my slides. Um, if there's time, take questions. Um, and yes, my book, uh, American Rebels, How the Hancock, Adams, and Quincy Families Plan the Flames of Revolution is available at the Fairfield Bookstore. And if you buy my book from the Fairfield Bookstore, I will make sure that there's a signed book, plate, Get a pick and a very nifty little tote bag. So you not only get a book, you get a book plate and a tote bag. Very nice. It's so very <laughs> exciting. We're so um, excited to have you. I know we can't do it in person, but this is great right now to be able to share and meet you online. Um, you. And I also wanted to mention that we will be taking some questions um, if we have time uh, after Nina's sure. discussion. Um, and so if you do have any questions, you can use either the Facebook comment feature if you're watching on Facebook Live. Um, I'll be able to see those questions and we'll do some moderation at the end. Um, you can also use the YouTube comment feature if you're streaming live on YouTube. So again, if you have any cues, we'll be able to give you those answers towards the end of tonight's broadcast. So um, feel free at any point in time to just drop a question in. I am going to go to my slideshow now. So um, let me get there. Okay. Cover of the book. Everybody sees it. Good. My book, American Rebels, 
begins in the year 1744 at the funeral for Reverend John Hancock. A large crowd gathers for the funeral of their minister because he is a beloved minister. Um, Ebene Reverend Ebenezer Gay has come from Hingham, not too far away, to preach the funeral service in the Old North Parish Church. Let me get a picture of that up for you. There's the church and there is the churchyard where Reverend Hancock will be buried. 11 years earlier, Reverend Gay had married John Hancock to Mary Hawk Baxter, and now very sadly, he has to bury him. The community of Braintree is bereft. You know, for as I said, Reverend Hancock was a good man. He was a beloved man, as well as an inspiring minister. And everyone feels anguish for his family as well, for his wife, Mary, and their three children, a daughter also named Mary, a son named Ebenezer and a son named John. And yes, that is John Hancock with the big signature who was there in the church that day mourning the death of his father. What no one could have known then in 1744 was that the future leaders in the American fight for independence were in that congregation. Really, it's only in retrospect that we can see that the death of Reverend Hancock set in motion events that would bring together a group of young men and women and set them on the path to rebellion. I first discovered Reverend Hancock and his village and this progeny of heroes while searching through the collections of the Massachusetts Historical Society in Boston. I was searching for an answer to a question that had long fascinated me. Ever since I had begun actually researching my previous book, The Lowells of Massachusetts. Now, while researching that book and the story of the, the Lowell family, I was looking into the life and times of 18th century lawyer, John Lowell. He was a lawyer, an entrepreneur, a judge, community leader. And I have a picture of him for you. There he is. Um, when I looked into his life and, and his times and the years leading up to the American Revolution, I was surprised to find that at first he did not want to join the rebel cause. He didn't want to break with England. And I really found myself considering for the first time just how difficult a choice that was for American colonists. I mean, they had been raised by family, by church, by the state, to be loyal British citizens. They were proud of being British citizens. Um, how were they going to make that choice to rebel and seek independence? It was a momentous choice to rebel or to stay loyal. And the choice of rebelling against king and country carried with it grave threats to, to your home, to your family, to your security, even to your own life, because rebels were traitors and would be hung for treason. Um, John Lowell did end up joining the Patriot cause, but his decision to join in with the other rebels had not been easily or quickly made. So in documenting that decision and how John Lowell came to that decision, I came to see that the choice of loyalty or rebellion was not as easy as so many of us are led to believe in our high school history classes. And I wondered how, how did the American colonists have the guts to rebel against England? I mean, they were this mighty power, this mighty naval power. They could crush empires and build empires. Um, and yet the American rebels had the courage to rise up against them. How did that happen? And I wondered how did that choice to rebel cut across class lines? How did it cut across gender lines, I wondered. And I began to look for a community to study in which men and women of different classes and backgrounds work together towards independence. I wanted to find a community where I could see people deciding to rebel, not deciding, men and women, different gen different classes of people. And by a twist of luck, I came upon a book titled, Where Independence Began. Bring up that slide. 
It was written by a minister and a kind of quirky historian named Daniel Monroe Wilson. And in that book, I found this paragraph. In the aspirations and heroisms of that little community of Braintree, independence began. Few towns can boast of history more brightly colored, not only with deeds of patriots, but with the surprises of romance, not only with the sturdy enterprises of plain liberty-loving farmers, but with the debonair discourse of the colonial gentility. Well, I was hooked by these words. I mean, independence, farmers, liberty, gentility, these leaders of the revolution that stars my new book, who, who are these people? Where, where did they come from? How did this come to be? Well, let's get started. Let me introduce you to the rebels that I write about in my book, American Rebels. Now, of course, you all know John Hancock, son of the Reverend Hancock. He was not only the son of a minister, he was the grandson of a minister. And Hancock most likely would have become a minister himself, but for the intervention of his uncle, actually more importantly, his aunt, Lydia and Thomas Hancock, who adopted John after the death of his father. Did you know that John Hancock risked his life again and again and spent a vast amount of his own money to fight for the rights of his fellow colonists? And despite the often searing pain of gout from which he suffered for years, he continued his work for his fellow colonists. Now, you know John Adams, of course, and you're most likely familiar with his incredible ambitions not only for his colony, but also very much for himself. What you may not know about is the passionate romance between Adams and a young woman from Braintree named Hannah Quincy. Hannah was cousin to Abigail Smith, who later, of course, became John Adams' wife and became the Abigail Adams we all know and love. So how did that first romance begin? And why did it end? And when did Abigail Adams and John Adams get together? Well, that whole event <laughs> could take me quite a while to explain. And it is really important. It's relevant. It explains so much of John's future. It explains his development both as a person and as a rising lawyer in the colony. Um, but I don't have time to go into that tonight. So I recommend that you read my book, American Rebels to find out more about John's early life, early romantic entanglements, and how he came to meet and marry Abigail Adams. Here, Abigail Smith, who became Abigail Adams, here she is. She spent a good deal of her childhood in Braintree. She stayed with her grandmother, Quincy, who lived there, a woman who appreciated Abigail's wit and boundless energy. As the grandmother described it, she had wild colts made the best horses, and she was sure that Abigail would grow up to become something special. And she certainly did. Let me introduce another Quincy woman. This is Dorothy Quincy, known as Dolly. Dolly Quincy would become the wife of John Hancock, but only after years of courtship. Why was Dolly so hesitant to tie the knot? Well, I think it had a lot to do with her upbringing. Um, she had known both wealth and deprivation in her life, and she was determined to forge her own path to be reliant on nobody and not to be charmed by the wealth of Hancock. In the end, in fact, it was his commitment to the patriot cause that charmed her and that won her over. But not before one last brief flirtation, which took place just down the road from the Fairfield Museum and History Center. <laughs> Let me take a moment to tell you about the summer of 1775. Following the Battle of Lexington and Concord in April, Dolly and John Hancock had to flee Massachusetts and the Redcoats and they came to Fairfield seeking refuge um, in the home of Thaddeus Spur, 
who was a, a family friend of the Hancocks and a uh, wealthy Fairfield resident, uh, community leader. Along with Hancock's Aunt Lydia, Dolly was invited by Thaddeus Burr to spend the summer at his house, while John Hancock went back down to Philadelphia to resume his duties as president of the Continental Congress. Well, who should come for a visit to Fairfield uh, and the Burr homestead? But young Aaron Burr, yep, Aaron Burr, he was on break from attending law school at the Litchfield Law School, the first law school in America. Now, we all know um, that Aaron Burr is a flirt because we've all seen Hamilton, <laughs> either on the stage or as I did on Disney Plus. Um, he was a flirt. And although Aaron was a good nine years younger than Dolly, the two quickly hit it off because Dolly was also a flirt and she enjoyed spending time with this young, handsome, smart man. In fact, their flirtations grew so lively that even Thaddeus Burr noticed it. As he wrote in a letter to Tapping Reeve, who was the head of the, of the Litchfield Law School, this letter can now be found in the collections of the Fairfield Museum and History Center, which is where I read it here in the archives of the Fairfield Museum. Now, Aunt Lydia also noticed the fun that Dolly was having with young Aaron Burr. And she wrote to her nephew, John, um, and told him to get himself up to Fairfield as soon as possible. Thaddeus Burr, on his part, he took care of dispatching young Aaron on his way. By the end of August, John Hancock was in Fairfield and he was married to Dolly at the Burr homestead on August 28, 1775. The homestead, as it looks today, does not look the same as it did in 1775. In fact, the Burr homestead where John and Dolly were married was burned down by the British in 1779. John Hancock encouraged Thaddeus Burr to rebuild his house, and he even offered to pay for the windows for this new house on one condition, that Thaddeus would build a house identical to John Hancock's house in Boston on Beacon Hill. And he did, he did build a house like that. I'm gonna show you in these slides. So the house um, to my left, so hopefully that's to your left as well, <laughs> is the house of Thaddeus Spur. The house to the right is the house of John Hancock in Boston. You can see they are practically identical. The Hancock Mansion was demolished in the 1800s, and there's a replica of it uh, in Ticonderoga, New York. The Burr Homestead was renovated in the 1840s, which is why it now has these big columns and a big veranda, which, as you can see, it didn't have when it was originally built. So after the wedding of John and Dolly, they left immediately for Philadelphia for the, because it was getting a little unsafe to be in Connecticut with the British red coats breathing down their necks. Um, so they headed for Philadelphia where John once again took up his presidency and Dolly went to work. She went to work as the unpaid secretary of the Continental Congress. Now in my book, American Rebels, I follow Dolly and John and the other young men and women of Braintree through their youth and into adulthood explaining their connections, their motivations and ambitions, their weaknesses and their strengths. I present their stories to demonstrate how colonists had the courage to rebel against England, to challenge England, and also to illustrate the huge obstacles they faced, um, both personally and within their communities in making that final choice to rebel. By focusing in on the particular circumstances of these men and women, we can understand just how monumental a task it was to rebel and how ordinary humans took on that monumental task and became heroes by caring for their community, by remaining loyal to their community and to their ideals. There is one last rebel from Braintree I want to introduce you to today. He is a forgotten hero of the American Revolution, J. 
Josiah Quincy Jr. Josiah was known in his lifetime as the Patriot. He was called by this name because he was the most impassioned and impassioning writer and orator of his time. Already eight years before independence was declared, Josiah Quincy wrote about his growing disillusionment with the British government. His words really resonate with me, and I think with how many Americans feel today about our current situation and about our government's failure to address present day injustices and long accepted oppressions. And I'm gonna read this, this, this uh, piece out loud and um, you can see for yourself. So this is Josiah Quincy writing in 1768, and here we go. To see the daily blunders which are committed and the deep tragedy which is now acting on the political theater and not to be moved is to be an unfeeling wretch indeed. If the contempt and indignation of every sensible and humane man in Christendom were sufficient to explode a political system, there would be some hopes of seeing change in our colony. Well, over the next eight years, as England tightened its fist on American colonists by subverting the courts, condemning the free press, prohibiting peaceful meetings, flooding Boston with occupying troops, offering immunity from colonial justice to British soldiers and officers, and attempting to enter and secure private properties for their own purposes, as well as executing warrantless searches, instituting juryless trials, all forbidden under the British rule of law and constitution. Well, the American rebels, the American colonists, grew more and more tired of the oppressions. The flames of rebellion grew, grew hotter, brighter, wider, until they burst into uprising and ultimately the Declaration of Independence. Now, Josiah Quincy was not only a writer and orator, he was also a lawyer and a much sought after lawyer. In fact, he was the lead lawyer for Thomas Preston, a British army officer, and the soldiers who were under Thomas Preston's command, who fired on Boston civilians in the Boston Massacre in March of 1770. The British captain had asked Josiah Quincy to represent him because Josiah was known as the best lawyer in Boston. Josiah agreed to do the defense and then he asked John Adams, John Adams, Patriot John Adams, to help him with the defense and Adams agreed. So why did Quincy and Adams, these Patriots, these rebels, agree to represent British troops accused of murdering American colonists? Well, to prove, to prove to the world that the colonists of Massachusetts were law-abiding in all circumstances, that they respected the rights to counsel and trial and representation as guaranteed under British law, and that they, the colonists, were deserving of having their rights restored to them under British law. So how did that trial go? Well, not only Boston, but all of the American colonies and England from afar. Now, of course, news of the trial traveled back to England very slowly. We had to go by ship, it would, you know, six weeks later before they heard anything that happened, but everyone was following the trial. And I could take up the next hour talking about the trial. Instead, once again, I urge you to read American Rebels to find out how Josiah and John's trial strategies worked I will share with you that the prosecutor in the case was Josiah's own brother, Samuel Quincy, the royally appointed solicitor general for the colony. And this of course only added more drama to the proceedings. Now, in addition to being a writer, an orator and a lawyer, Josiah Quincy Jr. was also a diplomat. He traveled far and wide seeking American unity seeking peace in America. Despite his crippling health issues, he had been ill really his whole entire life. Um, and in his early twenties, he was diagnosed with consumption. 
terrible disease um, that would kind of come back, you know, recur and then die back, recur, die back. And Josiah knew he was going to die young. But he used his illness as a kind of spur to keep himself going in the fight for the rights of colonists. As he himself said, the seeds of dissolution are thickly planted in my constitution. They must soon ripen. I feel how short is the day that is allotted to me. However short the time he had, Josiah would use it to secure the rights of his fellow colonists. He understood early on the importance of union between the 13 American colonies to secure their rights. A unified front between the colonies would have power against England, while quarreling colonies would not. And so Josiah developed a strategy of diplomacy to, to promote understanding across the North and South. He knew that the Southern colonies interests and concerns were different from those of the Northerners. Their economies were different. Religion was treated in a different way. The courts and administrative offices in each colony were different. And yet Josiah was sure he could bring Northerners and Southerners together. As he wrote in a letter to a friend, let us forgive each other's follies and unite while we may. To think justly is not sufficient, but we must think alike before we shall form a union. And once that union is formed, we are invincible. To form a union. Quincy saw that what was needed in the fight against the British was for the colonists to be joined together in their demands and their resolve. But how could he get the process started? So in early 1773, Josiah planned a trip south in which he would go by sea to Charleston and then travel back north by horse, visiting all the different colonies along the way. Josiah's father, his wife, his siblings, they all counseled against taking the trip. Travel by sea in the winter months was sure to be rough and it was always risky. The boat would go through waters around Bermuda and then swing back towards Charleston and people already considered that part of the, of the sea coast to be, uh, to be cursed. The Boston Triangle was already, uh, Bermuda Triangle was already uh, a cursed area. But Josiah went anyway. Unfortunately, his father and his family had been right. Storm after storm assailed the boat the further south they went. And I'm going to read from Josiah's journal here. He described it as the waves, waves seem to curl with flames and the sky overhead is black and heavy. Seas rise in wrath and mountains combat heavens. Thunders roll and oceans roar. And the conditions only worsened the further south they went. Rain, hail, snow, and sleet descended with great violence, and the wind and waves raged all night. Those are Josiah's words, not mine, written in his journal. It was not until the end of March that Josiah's family back in Massachusetts finally got the news. Josiah was alive. He had landed safely and all was good. He wrote to his wife to assure her as to his health. Everything looks favorable at present that way, he wrote. And he wrote about the ample trade, riches, magnificent and great state in Charleston, but adding there is much gaiety and dissipation. Well, the rich and powerful men of Charleston quickly warmed to Josiah. I mean, after all, he, uh, he appeared to be one of their own. He was rich, savvy, cultured, uh, interested in good food and good wine. They really liked him. Josiah liked them too, but he silently disapproved of many of the activities that he saw going on around him. He wrote in his journal, cards, dice, 
the model and horses engross prodigious portions of time and attention. Josiah was thoroughly scandalized. Uh, by how attendance at church in the South appeared to be seen as yet another occasion for socializing and not the serious practice that church going was for New Englanders. As he wrote in his journal, in the South, the Sabbath is a day of visiting and mirth, of license and frolic. Nevertheless, Josiah was heartened by meeting up with scores of active patriots men he described as hot and zealous in the cause of America. Going to stay with these Southerners in their homes, men such as Cornelius Hartnett, a man Josiah called the Sam Adams of the South, and getting to know the men and their concerns, he was sure that friendships and working relationships with these Southern patriots were possible. Ultimately, as Josiah traveled back north, working his way through the South and then the Mid-Atlantic, he formed strong relationships with a number of men who would later stand with New England at the meetings of the Continental Congress, which began in the fall of 1774. And then of course, culminating in the signing of the Declaration of Independence in July of 1776. Get that picture up there. Now, one aspect of Southern life and culture, which Josiah abhorred, and which he predicted would prove to be an obstacle for national unity was slavery. He was horrified by its prevalence in the South. He saw it everywhere. And he was disgusted by its acceptance by so many of the leaders of the Southern colonies. He saw the treatment of slaves as indications of hypocrisy. As he wrote, there is much among this people of what the world would call hospitality and politeness, but it may be questioned what proportion there is of true humanity, Christian charity, and love. Josiah feared that the eradication of slavery would be difficult with great opposition from the South, he predicted resentment, wrath, and rage, and wrote, slavery may truly be said to be the peculiar curse of this land. Now, Josiah would set out on one more journey of diplomacy before the American Revolution began. This was a journey to England. Um, it was a last ditch effort on his part to convince the king that the colonists' complaints were legitimate, that they did not seek war or independence, but only their rights under the British Constitution. There was a feeling among many colonists of New England and also of the, of the Southern colonies that the king didn't really know what was going on in America, that he was being fed misinformation, and that if he only were to hear directly from the colonists, he would see the, how loyal they were, what good subjects they were, how they should have their rights restored to them. So he went off to England. But unlike the successes Josiah experienced during his journey to the Southern colonies, in England, he found little support among parliamentary leaders for his American position, for his American viewpoint. And the king absolutely refused to entertain his proposals of reconciliation between the colonies and the mother country. Josiah spent months in London trying to sway opinion in favor of the colonists, but he faced defeat after defeat, not only with the king, but also in the halls of parliament and in private meetings. Disillusioned with the king and with parliament, Josiah became certain in early 1775 that war with England was both necessary and inevitable, and that it would be terrible. He wrote in a letter to his wife, our countrymen must seal their cause with their blood. Despite having again fallen seriously ill with consumption, in early March, 1775, Josiah began the ocean journey back to America. 
Why was he so determined to leave? He was ill. He should have stayed in England, gotten better, and then gone home. Why was it just so urgent that he get back? Because he had been given a secret message, information gathered by the few English allies he had met. It was a message that could help the rebels in their fight against England and would help them understand the king's position and parliament's position. But as Josiah wrote in his journal, the message could only be delivered in person. It could never be committed to paper. I must go directly to Boston. No letters can go with safety. And I can deliver more information than could or ought to be written. My going now will be of great advantage to the American cause. Josiah's ship traveled over the ocean, another terrible journey, terrible storms. And he arrived in America in the harbor, Gloucester Harbor on April 26, 1775. Now, seven days earlier, the Battle of Lexington and Concord had been fought, but Josiah knew nothing about it. He had no idea that the colonists had held their own against the British and that he had been right that the path to war was now inevitable. So did he make it to land to deliver a secret message? Did he fulfill his final mission before dying from the illness that had dogged him his whole life? You'll have to read American Rebels to find out. In closing, I just want to say that the path to revolution was not so clear or simple as so many of us are taught in school. There were disagreements, arguments, full-blown fights among friends and family members over which was the right way to go, to rebel or to capitulate, to capitulate, to stay loyal. There was uncertainty, lots of fear. There was debate and compromise. There was hard-headed determination on all sides. And for those who decided to rebel, they put everything on the line their lives, their fortunes, their futures, all in the hopes of securing liberties and justice and guaranteed rights for their communities. The immensity of their sacrifices and the great losses they endured only amplifies how much they value doing what was right for the world in which they lived. So much of what I write about in American Rebels is relevant to our current situation, not only politically, but also with how they suffered through terrible epidemics, how they received conflicting news reports, how they remained isolated from friends with letters taking weeks and even months to arrive, how they suffered deprivations in the present and uncertainties as to what the future might hold. And yet they persevered. When I wrote American Rebels, of course, I could have had no idea of the pandemic that would ravage the world this year, nor of the massive protests following the death of George Floyd and too many other black men and women, nor of the wildfires that have laid waste to thousands of acres and left so many Americans homeless, townless. The response to the horrors of the past nine months has been tremendous. So many say that there has been political, community, and social action like never before. But I say perhaps not quite like never before. The actions undertaken by the American rebels I write about, the actions to secure their freedoms, were also massively progressive, bold, and potentially dangerous. In many ways, the issues they faced then, we are facing again today. Brutality of occupying troops, restriction of liberties, failure to be safe in your own home, lack of accountability of policing forces, lack of trusting government and leadership. These are all reasons why the American rebels made the difficult and dangerous decision to rise up against England and fight for independence. A reader of my book has described how I take big figures from history, John Adams, John Hancock, Abigail Adams, 
and bring them back down to human size. That's because the American rebels were human. They were ordinary people with weaknesses as well as strengths. But there's also no doubt that they were heroes who put their community first, never losing their sense of duty and integrity and discovering unexpected stores of courage. I'll finish up with a quote from Josiah Quincy Jr. Something he said to his fellow patriots to encourage them through the hardships of their times. I'm sure we can all find some encouragement ourselves from what he had to say. May you have the fortitude to suffer, courage to encounter, and activity and perseverance to press forward. So I wish for all of us fortitude, courage, activity, and perseverance. Thank you. If there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. So thank you, Nina, so much for that great introduction to American Rebels and for sharing kind of some really interesting tidbits that I know enticed me and or made me laugh um, out loud, I will say, <laughs> during that talk. Um, so we do have a couple of questions. And so I will note to everybody who is watching uh, that you can actually post a question either on Facebook. Um, we can see it here and we can certainly answer. Um, you can also post your questions on YouTube Live. Um, and so I'll just start off with um, one of the questions who, that came in on YouTube. Um, how much of what you learned about these men and women and the period uh, came from the journals they kept and the letters they wrote? So those beloved primary sources for all yeah. of us researchers and museum people and libraries. Um, how yeah. much of what you learned and, and where where did they come from? Right. Well, so much of what I learned came from journals, letters, um, uh, diary entries that that um, just like um, ledger type entries. So much of um, like John Hancock's business as he grew his business with his uncle, for example, you know, studying these old ledgers. The Massachusetts Historical Society was definitely a huge Fount of information. I was lucky enough to receive a fellowship from uh, the Massachusetts Historical Society, which allowed me to really spend a lot of time um, in their archives, in their collections, and it was just a tremendous collection. Um, then there were many towns throughout Massachusetts that had wonderful historical societies, and here in Fairfield, um, the, the collections here at the Fairfield Museum and History Center, uh, especially about the Burr family and about Litchfield Law School, all very interesting and all really gave me so much information about what life was like for people in the years leading up to the revolution. Um, I, I, I just have to raise this issue, which is that now that we're all in the COVID um, sort of quarantine mode, I cannot imagine how researchers who are working on books now, and in fact, I'm starting to do research for a new book, and we're, it's very difficult because we can't get into those archives where we find these, these morsels um, of information. We find these unique little stories that illuminate the lives of people and the times in which they live. Uh, and so it's just a really difficult time. Uh, fortunately, the Library of Congress um, has huge digital collections, as does the Massachusetts Historical Society and Harvard and different universities have, have, have digitized a lot of their collections, but it's really those unknown facts, those little treasures that can only be found when you, you know, you open a letter that no one's opened in 200 years and you find some little tidbit about daily life and you realize this illuminates a whole um, way of looking at the years uh, before the American Revolution. So um, this is just another way that the pandemic is affecting life in our times. 
Yeah, no, that's one of the things that, you know, we at the museum um, certainly kind of share in, in understanding. Um, our library is actually open by appointment, so we are still kind of open to those under the current guidelines. Of course, uh, those who'd like to come do some research, you can certainly make an appointment on our website and fairfieldhistory.org, so come on by. Um, but, you know, we certainly... Um, love to talk about those primary resources and the amount of personalities that come out in written documents. Yeah. Um, you know, it's kind of interesting to compare to social media today, the personalities that come out and, and you know, under writing under pseudonyms or, you know, being yeah. anonymous in the letters. And it strikes me that a lot of the connections and personalities that you picked up on um, of the folks of Braintree is very similar to what uh, researchers who've looked into those who were raised together uh, across the Sound in Setauket as part of the Culper Spy Ring. So the trust um, that's developed when you grow up with people and the personalities that you get to know comes out in these primary resources. And that does kind of come on to or you know, walk into another one of the questions that we got online was, do we know why Hancock wanted the Burr mansion or the Burr house to look like his own house in Boston? That seems a bit presumptuous. I, I agree. It's such a strange thing that he would that he would want that. I mean, you, he was so proud of that house. His uncle had built the house um, and his uncle was inordinately proud of this house because, um, you know, John Hancock's family was not a wealthy family. And it was his uncle, Thomas Hancock, who built this huge empire um, based on commerce and trade and actually very much based on supplying the British with arms and um, clothing and other supplies they needed to fight the Seven Years' War in America. Um, but he also sold books and he sold, sold, he sold everything. He started out at a bookseller and then went on to sell everything. So he made a huge amount of money coming from a very simple background. His father was a minister in Lexington and he built this huge mansion where he brought in you know, the best limestone and he brought marble from here and he, he had all of his merchants bring treasures from any European port they stopped in. Um, so he must have really given that pride of place to John Hancock, who um, inherited the house when his uncle died. Um, so in a way, you would think he'd want to have it be his own unique house. Um, and yet what he wanted was for Thaddeus Burr to replicate his house. And I really, I, I don't find um, any documentation for why that was so. And it is a very interesting question. And that is another one of the sort of intrigues for me of, of doing historical research is that you don't always find the answer to the questions you're looking for. And you can spend a lot of time looking, looking, looking. And I, I, I wanna remind people, you're not reading um, a text. You are reading cursive writing, loop de loop de loop de cursive writing. And it can really give you a headache when you're trying to go through letters, journal entries, and figure out why something happened, why something didn't happen. Um, but it's the hunt that is so exciting. And when you do find an answer and you can tell others the answer that you found, I mean, it's, just, it's so exciting. But I don't have an answer to that question as to why John Hancock wanted his house replicated. And it's always an interesting insight where you're you're really kind of researching, researching, researching. And you're like, oh, this has to be there. And you never get to know the answer. Yeah. Or you never get to see the letter that was replied to or replied from. And so you're trying to read into someone's letter that they're answering questions to which you never saw. Right. Um, and, you know, and the delay of information during the 18th century is always one of those moments of realization, our automatic response now. Um, yeah. I mean, if we don't get an email back within an hour, we think something's wrong, right? right. And so, you know, they waited for weeks on end to learn about yeah. things that they didn't even know happened. Well, um, and people have asked me if I think the revolution could have been averted if there had been a faster exchange of information, um, possibly, possibly, possibly there could have been more negotiation rather than just confrontation. 
Uh, often a question that, you know, we hear in war and battles uh, between two competing cultures or two cultures is, you know, who's doing the interpretation, right? <laughs> who's the, who are the interpreters here? Um, and I always, I often think the most unrated people in history are interpreters because they can make or break those negotiations right, at any one time. Yeah, but, you know, thank you so much again for, you know, joining us here tonight. I know I always like to ask authors, you know, is there anything that you really wanted to include in this book that you weren't able to? Any primary research or, or objects that came up that uh, just didn't quite make it in? Well, Josiah Quincy Jr. was a revelation to me. I mean, I just had not heard of him or known of how important he was or what an incredible writer he was. Um, he has a passionate thoughts, not only about politics, but about his wife and his children and his father and about his hometown. Um, and I really could have written a whole entire book about him. Uh, so there were some stories about Josiah Quincy Jr. that I couldn't include. Um, but that I, you know, maybe I'll save them for another book. <laughs> Well, I, I, I hope we'll get to read that book because those, I'm sure, some probably very passionate experiences yeah. in the self lover romance book <laughs> between them all. Well, thank you so much again, Nina. Uh, tonight, it was a real joy to host you. And um, again, the name of your book? American Rebels, How the Hancock, Adams, and Quincy Families Fan the Flames of Revolution. And you can get your own little bag. <laughs> at, the University Bookstore. at the Fairfield University at our friends over at the Fairfield University Bookstore and again if you're interested in seeing some of these letters or some of the items from the people that um, Nina talked about tonight you can drop on by the Fairfield Museum we are open daily from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. and again we are uh, a nonprofit organization. And so we certainly um, support your and are welcome your contributions to help support the museum. Uh, had this been in person, it would not have been free. Um, it would have been free if you were a member. Um, however, um, we do always ask a, a donation of $5 um, if you were to come into the museum. So we would appreciate if you could donate tonight, we would uh, very much be grateful. Uh, so again, thanks to Nina, um, and uh, I look forward to talking with you again soon, and um, have a wonderful evening, everybody. Thank you, Laurie. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night.